Yeah. Uh, okay. It's a beginning. I like a beginning in a January. Um, so thank you for coming, everybody. Um, oh, hello. Um, so what? I think I started the, la the last session with what is this? So there's a more formal version of what is this now. Um, this is the first of a monthly event that we'll call Steps Play. So I've made a little bit of a prologue, as it's kind of like the first of 12. We won't do the prologue every time, but just a little bit about where this has come from. Um, it's a forum for questions, basically. And so um, we started, myself, Lizzie, Andy, Rob, at various times thinking about the kind of like what makes the, the regenerative different from the sustainable and realised that the more that you probe it, the more that you poke into it, the more that you look at it, it feels different in lots of different ways, but finding out why and how and why that's relevant and important to you is, is vital. And and to do that, asking questions, super important. So we have a, kind of a sense that when as a sustainability is the impact our action is having, there's something in the regenerative about the, the impact we're having on action. It is bigger than us. So whereas myself and Lizzie and Bob and Andy were came together individually, we realised the more people you draw into this, the more better questions you have. You can have more effect on broader action if you are part of something bigger. So it's really making this part of something bigger. We did an event, which some of you were at, last October? I, I don't know why I'm sort of asking everyone else. November. Do you want to say November? It's last November. Um, and so myself... <laughs> Autumn, much better. We did it in autumn. Um, so Rob and Andy and Lizzie and myself talked. And it was one of those great moments that no matter how good the talks are, the questions after are better and the conversation, the dialogue it invites. So we really wanted to get into this and say, right, okay, so how do, we, how do we make more of these? How do we make more of these things where people will speak, but more questions and more things will emerge? So that's what this is. We started the Steps Collective. Um, we put a QR code up and sort of like there's a mailing list and we thought, how do we make it as light as possible and just run it off the mailing list? And rather than having, oh, there's a big LinkedIn page and Twitter page and website. I don't want to build another website. Just rebuild a website. I don't want to build another one. Um, so just small, growing, informal. See what happens. End of pro. That's what you've come to. Thank you for coming to this. The STEPS Collective then. STEPS stands for Show the Easy Place to Start. What we're going to do is we're going to start each of the sessions this year with the following or iterations upon the following words. Lizzie suggested, and I love this idea, because then everyone just won't be looking at me as I read from the paper. But you all close your eyes as we start the session. We will listen to the words. This goes for anyone who's joined on Zoom as well. Close your eyes. Show the easy place to start. It is often mentioned, even by the most experienced travellers in the regenerative space, that they are continually finding their way. If we are to follow, we must look for their footprints and consider where we might place our own first steps. Today, we are here to share stories about how regenerative journeys began. T taking action is easier when you see and hear how others started. These stories will start in the early stages, with people alive to the unfolding environment around them. Hearing about the first steps of others can be a vital part of our own, but we will not walk alone. We help each other take these first steps to a regenerative future, not as experts, but as parents, neighbours, colleagues and citizens. Our stories are all different. To travel with efficiency and resilience, we must learn by what works for others and find a balance for ourselves between. There is no single answer to guide you, but many questions to orientate by. We want to help people shape a regenerative design for life. Navigating with uncertainty, switching between action and inspiration, moving before we think too much, and yet thinking before we go too far. Nobody can be certain about what is around the next bend or over the next peak. Hold on to your considerate, open and thoughtful outlook in our time together. There are many paths up the same mount. Thank you. So, 
with that, I would like to invite Liz to speak. There we go. Right. So um, I'm Liz. Uh, I was saying when I came in, it's the first time in a while I've done a talk in person. And um, the energy is completely different. It's much nicer than kind of looking at a, a, a grid of, of faces on a screen. So um, let's let's see. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is, um, or just as an intro, I'm going to sort of talk about the path I, I was on and, and the path I'm on now and the observations and questions that kind of led me from there to here. And, and that was very much inspired by um, the brief, the speaker's brief for today, which is, um, who are you? Where are you going? What sent you in this direction? And what signs and signals can you leave for others? And when I first read that, I thought panic because, because it, it was, and, and the story of how I reacted to this and where I got to is very much in parallel to the story I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, um, but panic because the, the world that I've been in was very much, you know, your talk is always going to be clear, you know, problem, question, answer, solution, results. You know, and it, it, there's always a clear path, and, and there's no questions without answers. You can't, you can't do that. And so this broad, quite open brief kind of threw me, threw me off. And then I thought, okay, but that's not where I am now. Here's where I am now. Refocus. Okay, now, now I've got it. So, so let's see, let's see how I get on. So, the first question, who am I? So I'm Liz, I'm an independent consultant and advisor and a, a fractional CEO. And I focus mostly on general management operations and strategy. I work with startups and small and medium companies and I try to focus on ones that are mission led and also ones that are doing kind of regenerative food and, and agriculture. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of um, where Kind of who I am and and where I've come from, um, well, quite literally the states, which you've all probably guessed, but um, but more broadly, um, uh, kind of a traditional business background. So I did um, I studied economics in university, worked for a few years, did an MBA, and then um, moved here to kind of start my business career. And I got to London, um, worked in management consulting, and then joined a big very big multinational corporation. And I worked there for just over 10 years. And during the, I guess the last couple of years that I was there, I started to see things or observe things, notice things that I hadn't really noticed before. I, I became aware that my, my pursuits there were just about kind of achieving business results and whatever those were, maybe it's growth, maybe it's um, the next slide, um, maybe it's profit, maybe it's this or that, but, but there, there wasn't anything more. And it felt like, like I and the people around me were there in order to have a good career there and be respected and get the results that we were meant to get. And there wasn't, as I said, there kind of wasn't anything more. And and I saw a couple of other um, things within that. I saw this drive to kind of exploit rather than invent your way out of, out of business problems. And that's especially disappointing in organizations that pride themselves on, on innovation. And I saw people viewing regulations as barriers or problems rather than opportunities to, to steal Lizzie's phrase, to do better. Um, I think that's really important. How can we turn this on its head and actually use it, use it as an opportunity? So I decided to kind of make a change and I worked in a startup that was kind of focused on sustainable and regenerative food and agriculture. And then I, went out on my own to do what I'm doing now, this kind of portfolio thing. And moving into that kind of path that I'm on now has given me the headspace and the time and the and the opportunities to discuss with people and, and digest things. And it's kind of got me to um, some questions 
which I want to share, which I don't have answers to. And this is very refreshing. So um, the big question, and this is why we're all here, and I've completely stolen this from John, which I told him I was going to do, is how do we get, um, how do we go in this direction, right? How do we go towards regenerative? And and I didn't invent this question. This is this is this is the whole thing, right? And and it's a big question, and you can't really, I can't really find a way into it. So I'm going to talk about some smaller questions that come out of it for me. But what I want to say about this is, in my head, um, sustainable is kind of is a bit in the middle, right? And it's it's kind of a static state. You're kind of a steady state. You're kind of going around. Regenerative is um, your you're doing better and then you're kind of standing on the shoulders of that better thing. And then you're doing better and you're kind of, you're kind of shuffling this way. Right. And, um, degenerative. And I, I stole John's slide, but I changed, I changed that from unsustainable to degenerative because I see that as also moving in a direction and, and always getting worse. So you're just moving, take, just like you're taking steps this way, you're taking steps this way and, and it's, and it's always getting worse. So, um, like I said, this is a big question. I can't find a way into it, but there are a couple of questions that kind of come out of this for me that I've been thinking about a lot that I that I wanted to share. So one is, how do you make greed uncool? So how do you go from Gordon Gecko to Eve Schwinnard? How do you get people again going going in in this direction? What does that mean? And and what things have that used to be cool have become uncool and what can we learn from those? And I haven't come up with a good example because um, it's hard. And, and I immediately though thought of smoking cigarettes. So that used to be cool, not so cool anymore, but it's not the same because smoking is bad for you and it's bad for the people around you. Greed is good for you, but it's bad for most of the people around you, right? So maybe that difference doesn't matter. I don't know, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep thinking about that. So the other question that I have is about um, convenience and cheapness. So so much of of what has made us a degenerative society is this drive for convenience and cheapness. And I, and I see it so much in, in food, of course. I mean, it's an obvious example, but there are so many others, fashion, transport, and lots of other things. But in food, you know, this, this focus on driving the cost down and the supermarkets and, and the convenience has got to be convenient. And then that, of course, pushes everything also into agriculture and makes that degenerative as well. So um, my question is, how do you put, how do you put that, convenience and cheapness genie back in the bottle? And um, can you put it back in the bottle? Uh, do you do you need to put it back in the bottle or is there another way? Once again, I don't know, but this is very cathartic and we're and we're sharing questions. <laughs> <laughs> we're sharing questions that we that we don't have answers to. So um, I'm kind of carrying these with me. I'm sharing them. I hope we have some good discussion about them um, afterwards. Um, the last thing I want to say is uh, is about this, and I want to I want to share a story. So um, when I was very much at that point of uh, moving from so leaving my corporate job and moving into this next chapter, I was literally on guard leave, so very much in that transition point. And it was January, so a terrible time to be on garden leave, but as many of you know, a good time for pruning. And so, and I've got this big apple tree in my garden and it needed, um, it needed a really big haircut. So I got my little pruning shears for the little stuff and my loppers, you know, for the bigger stuff. And then my saw for the, for the bigger ones went out there, went round, you know, got the stuff I could with the, with the first two. And then it was time to kind of get bigger branches with this, with this hand saw. And there were a few I could reach. And then there was one that was a bit, a bit higher up. And this particular tree has a, has a fork in it. 
So that's pretty low. So I kind of climbed up in the fork and I was leaning on one side and then bracing myself, woo, bracing, <laughs> bracing myself on the other side of the fork with, with my foot and then, and then, you know, really reaching to reach this branch. And, um, and normally when you saw, you want to be like this and you want to be able to get some power behind it. But I was kind of reaching and I guess my upper body strength isn't the best. And so I was kind of reaching and, and I thought, oh, this is going to take forever. And, and as you probably know, apple wood is hard. So it's not, it's not, you know, it's not easy to get through. And I'm reaching there and I'm thinking, oh God, what am I going to do? I'm cold, whatever. And I thought, well, maybe if I get halfway through and then I can just snap it off. And then I thought, no, 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 because that's going to leave a jagged cut. It might rip the bark, you know, make it vulnerable to disease, so on and so forth. Definitely not doing that. But I'm there and I'm just barely sawing and the cold and tired and my arm's getting tired. And I and I look up and I and I see this little this little flurry of sawdust coming down. And I thought, OK, all right. I'm getting somewhere, even though it's not as fast as I would like. I'm get I'm getting somewhere, and I and I go, and I think, and then I kind of stopped, and I thought to myself, Ah, Liz, as long as there's a bit of sawdust coming down, you're getting somewhere. And I kind of sat there and kind of like filed that away, and um, and I thought I think about that a lot. I think about you know. Oh, Maybe I'm not getting where I, you know, the old me comes in and oh, I'm not getting there fast enough. I'm not getting the results. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. But maybe that conversation or that idea that you shared with somebody or that connection or whatever it is, it's a bit of sawdust. And if you just keep looking for those when you feel like you're not getting somewhere, sometimes actually you are. And it's and it's a small step that you can take. So that's helpful for me. I hope it's helpful for you. And um, that's me. Thank you. Save your questions. <laughs> we'll roll with them. Well, lots of questions. I'll we'll do the questions internally. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone. Um, Making greed uncool, I like that. And little bits of sawdust. I, ha I have questions, I have thoughts. Um, so yeah, I'm Roland. Um, lovely, thank you. Ooh, okay. Um, show the easy place to start was your brief, John. And that reminded me of Two things. Firstly, that old joke, if you ask a stranger for directions, they'd say, I wouldn't have started from here, uh, which isn't terribly helpful advice. Um, but it also reminded me of a quote. I think it's attributed to Arthur Ashe, the tennis player, about whom I know nothing. But um, he said, um, start where you are, use what you've got, do what you can. And that feels I I'm channeling Arthur Ashe today, not the anonymous stranger. Um, so I will tell you a bit about myself, but work-wise, I want to just share three, three, I did call them projects, but then I crossed it out and I said three first steps, because they're all things I'm trying, and I would love help, ideas, advice, support. Um, and they sort of, I'm talking around regenerative design, but the words regenerative and design are not two words I tend to use together, so I don't feel entirely comfortable using them, but this is good practice. But my my working life tends to rotate around um, I'm a scientist once upon a time by education and uh, early career around climate technologies, around community building, ecosystem building. Uh, and I do quite a bit of stuff around sort of geeky data and ethical use of artificial intelligence. I wasn't going to talk about that third one, but if anyone's interested in a geeky conversation about that, then I'm your man. Um, so I want to start with uh, a question or, or a quote. Actually, this comes from an Irish poet, John O'Donoghue. Um, at any point in your life, you can ask yourself, at which threshold am I now standing? At this time in my life, what am I leaving? Where am I about to enter? And it goes on to say something like, what, uh, what gift would allow me to sort of take the next step or what's standing in my way? W words to that effect. So can I just do a quick show of hands? Who is in some aspect of their life or work, whether it's large or small, personal or professional, in some in transition in some aspect of your life or work right now? Who would Who would raise their hand to that? I think that's almost everybody. One one person is very stable. Oh no, no, they just haven't raised that yet. <laughs> so uh, I I love to ask that question because I think 
Um, I struggle with this every single day of my life. And I think um, I find it reassuring to know that I'm not alone. Hopefully, perhaps you take some comfort from that. I don't know. But I think um, I think we're living in weirdly liminal times. I'm slightly obsessed with the concept of liminality. Uh, again, I can talk about that for hours. I wasn't planning to today, but I think um, we're in transition at, at, at every scale of society, both individually, personally, the people in this room, but also especially in relation to climate, which is the majority of my, my focus of what I want to talk about. Um, and I'm reassured to hear that I'm, I'm not alone. Um, and, but in terms of what we do about that, being in transition can be anxiety provoking and scary, but it can also be a wonderful opportunity for transformation and change and innovation and reinvention. Um, and I love this quote from the, um, the artist Kay Tempest, connection is the feeling of landing in the present tense. So I invite you to land wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to be here and now and notice what you're noticing. Um, and a former collaborator, business partner of mine once described me as a compulsive connector. And I, I really like that. And I've a slightly cheesy way used that to sort of brand myself on various social media platforms. And, um, uh, and I've always been sort of obsessed with kind of connecting people and ideas and tiny biographical snippet, despite the accent. Um, I'm, uh, 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 my mom's German, my dad's American. I grew up mostly here, but also in a couple of other places. So I don't feel particularly of any of those cultures, but I caught kind of also feel of all of them as well. So in the last five or so years, I've really done a bit more sort of contemplation on how that's impacted the work that I do as a connector, as a facilitator, as a translator, both actual and metaphorical. Um, so tiny bit of science. Um, uh, it's probably hard to read, but this is a, a graphic that shows how connectivity scales sort of exponentially. It's not quite exponential, but don't worry about that. So um, the um, it's actually a geogra geometric progression for the mathematicians amongst you. Um, but if you imagine the white dots on the screen are people and the red lines are connections between people. Uh, if you have three people, you can have three different pairs, three different lines that you can draw between those dots. But with 10 people, you have 45 pairs and with 30 people, 435. So the number of connections grows much faster than the number of people. And what the, there's all sorts of wonderful perverse consequences of this, namely that with 30 people, in fact, with 23 people, it, the odds are that two people will share a birthday, which is highly counterintuitive for most people. It's called the birthday paradox. Google it if you don't believe me. Um, but you're sharing a birthday with someone in this room is kind of fun and interesting, but actually not that meaningful. But what else do John and I have known each other for a little while, but we've probably only had half a dozen conversations. I'm sure we know tons of people in common that we've not discovered yet. I'm sure we have loads of things in common that, that we've yet to sort of talk about. And I'm really interested in the stuff we have in common, the hidden connections. I think, even though I wouldn't describe myself as a designer, I think that's what design is, or perhaps one interpretation of design is about surfacing hidden connections. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, it's, uh, I think, all oh, right, okay, this is, no, we'll get into the questions. <laughs> well, let's make that a question. Um, I'm definitely keen to hear your point of view on that. Shall I keep going? Yeah. Um, so, um, but I think where many of us get stuck, myself included, is, you know, cheesy networking drinks. You don't know too many people. You find someone that looks moderately friendly. You have a chat. You find something you have in common, and you just talk about that all night until it's socially acceptable to leave. At least that's my experience of most networking events. You might be different. Um, but how can we benefit from our weird and wonderful differences? How can we push to the the diversity of our experiences? And you know, a new idea is simply a combination of two or more old ideas. So how, how can we connect where we have something in common but benefit from the differences? So those are some of the, the ideas that are percolating. And some of these made it, sorry, blatant plug, apologies, but um, <laughs> Uh, I wrote a little book, self-published a little book last year. Got two copies. The first two people that get down here after my talk can have one. Um, if you want, if you want one, you might not want one. Um, but uh, tells you a little bit more about me and some thoughts around making sense of our increasingly connected world. Um, somebody earlier just mentioned participatory cities, which is founded by the wonderful Tessie Britton, who is the quote on the on the front cover. So thank you, Tessie. Uh, but let me try and make some of this very I appreciate abstract. Um, ideas a little bit more tangible with 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 three three quick examples, three quite hardcore examples, but none are fully formed. And I we really need some help, ideas, creativity to to, to take these 
um, to realize them in the right sort of way. So number one, um, about 18 months ago, we were commissioned to do a bit of research around hotspots, around innovation and technology, around climate tech being the sort of phrase. Um, it was for a big Japanese multinational company, and we sort of did a whole ton of research and analysis. And much to our surprise, we found that the greatest concentration of climate tech talent, technology, money, and research exists within approximately four hours train travel of London. Um, that's not to say there isn't wonderful talent, technology, money, and research elsewhere in the world, but the greatest concentration of it is here. But I think we're terrible at telling this story. We're very fragmented politically and commercially and everything else. And what would happen if we could tell this story better? The new Palo Alto, the Silicon Valley of climate innovation, the biggest challenge on the planet right now, the biggest opportunity on the planet right now, and place really matters. Uh, and this is the time, this is the place to kind of do something about that. So how can we, what, that was an insight that myself and a bunch of other people got very excited about. We utterly failed to get anyone to put any money in, apart from EDF Energy, thank you very much EDF Energy for a small amount of money that allowed us to do a few bits and pieces. So that was wonderful, but um, we did get, lots and lots of support from some of these organizations and a bunch of others who i need to update this slide but um so currently grappling with this insight that there are all these bits of the jigsaw around us in this amazing city but it but also in antwerp and exeter and edinburgh and rotterdam and um uh how can we sort of connect some of those places some of those people some of those org organizations to unlock the innovation opportunity, the only one that really matters, I think, for me personally, namely the climate crisis. Um, but yeah, struggling with the business model and the funding model. So that's where I would particularly about value some ideas. Loads of people love it. Nobody wants to pay for it. Does anyone have that? <laughs> um, uh, so I'm spending my time earning a bit of a living doing two things. I wasn't going to talk about the second one, but the, the first one is a project called Future Ready um, to accelerate local transitions to net zero. It's very sort of adjacent to the super cost concept, but, it, but it's slightly separate. Um, this is a horrible slide, but this is uh, produced by Innovate UK, who are the funders. They're putting £60 million into 51 different local authorities across the UK. The only reason I've used this slide is to show that it's, every, it's everywhere. It's dotted sort of quite evenly across the country and our role liminal and a, bun a bunch of other organizations our job is to try and find collaboration opportunities and shared learning across these different places through online workshops offline um sorry uh offline workshops online uh, events and and a community platform there's loads of other components to it and it's wildly complex you remember the chart with the different connections we've got all that complexity and we're trying to navigate our way through it but I'm actually really, really excited about this, notwithstanding some of the uh, the bureaucratic challenges of running a big government contract and our role within that sort of quite far down the decision-making food chain. But um, there's something exciting in this. I think um, working at a kind of systems level, um, we almost certainly won't fulfill that potential, but we're definitely going to give it our best shot. So I'm not sure what my ask is here other than ideas suggestions help how can we plug in with what you're doing how can you plug in with what we're doing i guess that's the ask and this is the metaphorical net zero mountain that we're all trying to climb there's some research that i can share if anyone's interested about how these places are trying to get to be um carbon positive um tiny anecdote exeter was had this really progressive group of entrepreneurs policymakers startups citizens um trying to make exeter the greenest city in the world, in the UK, uh, it was some big ambition. Uh, they couldn't get anyone interested until they figured out to reframe the narrative around what they're doing. This took them about five years to get to do this, just to talk about extra as the best place to live and work in the UK or, or however you want to do that. So it's about thriving places. It's not about sort of the moral pace for saving the planet. It's just about an, an amazing place. Who wouldn't want to be part of an amazing place to live and work? So I've got lots of thoughts around the narrative around climate. It's very doom and gloom, we're all going to die and we might as well give up, or it's kind of techno-utopian and Elon Musk and his buddies are going to create massive carbon-sucking machines that are going to save us. Neither of those narratives are fit for purpose. I think we need more interesting narratives. The final project is a kind of side hustle, but for any anyone like running, 
This is the biggest climate relay in the world, I'm told. Two years ago, it went from Glasgow to Sharm El Sheikh, from COP26 to COP27, through 18 countries, nearly killed the organising team. Um, last year, it just went from uh, Big Ben, uh, sorry, Ben Nevis in Scotland to Big Ben in London. Uh, this is a picture from the final shot. Um, that's me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, this year um, we're doing a similar route all over the UK uh, from the 7th of June to the 4th of July. If anyone is interested in participating, bringing uh, a whole bunch of passionate climate positive um, runners uh, of all varying degrees of fitness, uh, please, uh, please get involved and please let me know. Um, so those are three first steps. Uh, those are three projects. I'm currently occupying quite a bit of my time. I'll just finish with a couple more questions, if I may. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, oh, I've got one minute, 43 seconds to go. Perfect. Um, uh, my son, I've got three kids. My eldest, 17, is studying philosophy. And studying philosophy for A-level significantly improves the quality of your dinnertime conversation. So <laughs> the other night he came back and they'd been discussing this question in his philosophy class. I don't know where it came from. But the question was, if your life was a book and you had read up to the point you are at now, would you keep reading? Uh, don't overthink it. Just quick show of hands. Who would keep reading? Yes or no? Yes, most people, a couple people, not so sure. Okay, so we had quite a long conversation. If you want, we can talk about this, but um, uh, a whole bunch of stuff around causality and free will and uncertainty, which I haven't got time to go into now. Though I was going to talk about uncertainty briefly, because one of my big aha moments in the last couple of years came from something, I was doing a podcast, which I've now paused, but where lots of people had said to me in that podcast that we're living in uniquely uncertain times. And I'm just not sure if that's true. Would people 100 years ago also not have think that of, of their time? Um, but then I saw this uh, bit of research, and it's a bit hard to read, but this comes from Scientific American looking at 175 years of their journal articles, billions and billions of words, or I don't know how many words, but lots of words. And, and the word certainty has gone down and the word uncertainty has gone up. I wouldn't read too much into that analysis, but but it, but there's something in that. But I don't know about you, certainly for me, uncertainty is something to somewhat to be feared and minimized in our lives. And yet, and yet, um, there's a wonderful woman called Margaret Heffernan, who's a writer and thinker and has done TED Talks and things like that, who, who said to me, uh, uncertainty is what gives us agency and it's an opportunity. Ooh. I thought I turned that off, sorry. Um, it's an opportunity for change and choice. And she went on to say, it's where the joy in life lies. It's where, um, who wants to know the day that they're gonna die? Who wants to know what you're gonna get for your next birthday? That would be really kind of boring if you knew that. So um, uncertainty is in the right way, something to be embraced. Um, uh, and that's, it's a wonderful opportunity. So I, um, I just thought I'd share that because for me, that was really kind of quite liberating. Um, and actually, John, you said something, oh, I've lost my page, about many paths up the mountain. Was that what you said? Um, and you may have seen this image. I don't know who created it. It did the rounds on social media uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but we tend to focus on the paths behind us that are close to us and forget about the many paths that are available to us in the future. And so think green, folks, think green. Um, I think that was it. Oh, yeah, this was just a question I liked. Um, I don't know how it relates to everything else I said, but what will you realise six months from now that you already know? Um, I think that's a great question to, to meditate on if you have time. Um, and, yeah, push to the edges if, if, you're, um, if you're stuck in any way. The most interesting things happen on the edges of organisations, places. Um, so, yeah, that's it from me. The fonts are all different sizes. But those are my details. That's my fault. <laughs> that's, my, that's your fault. Sorry if I slightly overran, but uh, thank you for listening. Down or my... Yeah, I like Do you want to go to the lead? Do you want to go to the lead? I feel like I've been up enough there. I've been better. thinking. There's like all of these people who. Some of you I've never met in real life and just been on the screen. Some of you I've known for years and years and years and haven't been for years and years. Um, <clears throat> so thank you both Liz and Roland. Um, that was really wonderful. Um, and I guess maybe 
just to reiterate, because it was up on the slide at the start, but maybe it's useful to say that for um, Sean and Andy and, and Rob and myself, we've described us ourselves as facilitators of this space. So I guess um, we are doing the facilitating today, but it's also important to say that this is an emergent conversation. This is an emergent community of practice. And so at any point, if anyone else wants to take over, you're, you're really welcome. Um, does anyone have a burning question or maybe another place to start is what resonated with you from what you just heard? It's kind of <clears throat> doubling to the top. Oh, hang on. One, one point of logistics. We have people online, so we have... I'm British. Um, it's just, it's awkward. Um, I think one thing is, is kind of everyone sees like regenerative as right. Nothing. We have an impact just by breathing, just by buying a piece of clothing, by going into a charity shop we can do. And so the question is, what are the steps to doing? And I think that miscommunication is something that, that Roland picked up on is really important is actually how do we go, well, what's the first thing? And one of the first things that, that can be, and it can be really simple, um, so like a, a, in, in Lewis, where I live, um, we have a walking bus for all the kids just to go to school. And it's parents with neon jacket and two ropes either side. And it's, it sounds like, and you just like, all oh, right, it's your turn to take the walking bus. It's your turn. Not sure. These things is like, you're like, oh, yeah actually people have gone it's great because somebody else gets to talk to my kids somebody else and they, it's parents because of course it can't be legislated or things like that it's just do you trust me great um but then the kids start talking to the other parents in a completely different way because they're peers they're not their parents so they're like oh i've been meaning to tell daddy about this oh well maybe you should just talk about that and so all this other stuff happens and so sometimes these things are there are a series of interventions and the problem is, is how do we enable just go, let's just do it because it's better. Um, and I think that's, that's often the challenge is it's not, I think business sometimes imagines it is this massive whole scale change, which they can do arguably. Um, but also it's kind of how do we want it to sit as well? I think so. What are those steps in between? It's an observation really rather than a question. And I think it's kind of what are those touch points to build on it? And, I guess this is me doing Roland your compulsive connection but I'm curious in that when you say we have the walking bus and then all this other stuff happens I'm curious whether we talked about in our very first conversation here are there any things where we see patterns between different potentially regenerative things and one of the things that I observe is there's more than one thing happening and whereas with a I guess a sort of traditional design brief you have a question and then your job is to come up with the answer and there's one answer and then maybe some other stuff happens and that's great but it's secondary benefits and it's kind of accidental and maybe it's sort of entropy that's reframed as something really positive and I guess I'm just wondering that in regenerative systems things environments is there always more than one thing like that that there's a lot of stuff going on and all of these things are kind of creating positive feedback and that's almost I'm really I've said to a lot of people I'm really anxious about making like universal statements because I think it's really problematic but might that be kind of a the core principle. Does anyone want the box, Emily? I don't know if I can throw it or the box. Well, along the line, and not <laughs> long. Um, this really ties into something we've been thinking quite a lot in our project at the moment um, about the kind of relationality and the interconnectedness of everything. And so often the best way I think we've we're working on is just to try it and see what else happens because you can never predict everything that might come out of something. Um, and I would highly recommend having a look at some of the stuff he's written, but um, a guy called Bio Akamalafe, who has described himself as like an ex 
an ex lots of things because he's done lots of stuff and then it's like mm, I don't do that anymore so he's really interesting but he always talks about the gaps in the pavement and so it's all the things that you don't expect and so you have a paving slab but everything that happens around it is also as valuable as interesting but gets overlooked and I think that's what's really interesting with that example you've got the mission or the aim or the goal of something that's often quite simple but then there's so much else that might come out of it that could be really positive and actually have a far more positive effect than the original goal um but yes yeah, so that was just a something we're thinking lots about as well so it's really interesting just to connect that to something that liz said well my, in my notes uh so when you picked up lizzie's question about do better and but you juxtaposed it so quickly about sort of like the 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 corporate life and it just got me into thinking it's sort of like how do, how do how do you put do better as a KPI. So rather than get very, very precise and very centred on the thing and so on, it's kind of like, what's your KPI? Do better. When you know better, do better. And at the end of the year, we will work out together whether you have done better. It's the kind of like, sort of like make, make these things bigger in a way rather than ever granular, smaller things that you're just trying to do the thing that you agreed 12 months ago that everyone in the room knows isn't relevant anymore. But you totally lose any agency you had for doing better because you're going. No, we're just doing the things that looked relevant to us twelve years ago, uh, twelve months ago. And we put in a bit of paper. Okay, someone on the lines with their hand. Do you want... oh, okay, I think. Should we do a short Yeah. Respond, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think um I think it's I think it's really hard, which is which is why I kind of threw up my hands, right? Yeah. I think and I, Lizzie and her studies and the stuff she thinks about and the stuff she talked about last time probably maybe has a better answer than I have, but I think it has to be tied into your your bigger mission, right? If your mission is to flog stuff and ship it to people in brown boxes, then I don't know how you shoehorn doing better into that. But if your mission is is something else, like, you know, um, thinking about organizations I've worked with, convert as much farmland as possible to regenerative farming. Like, okay, you've kind of baked it in, right? So I think you have to figure out how to bake it in. And if and if it and if it's not part of your business model, then you're, you're, you you have to pivot or to, sorry to use a really gross like business word you, you have to pivot or or you I don't know you have to figure out another another way of of um of measuring it and and actually making people care about it even though it may not be central to what you're doing uh, well, Lizzie, the... I just have one tiny response because I'm reminded of something that Louis said last week if they but when do when do we stop? So with that business model that doesn't have it baked in, at what point do you just go, just stop doing, stop doing the business, stop doing the investment, stop doing the because, because again, like back to the original premise of sustainability versus regeneration, that that pivoting is going to take you such a long way round that it's not even net neutral. It's just harmful. And there's quite an interesting conversation. I want to say her name is Iona and I'm blanking on her surname. And she has a project, which I think is called the Decelerator. And she's initially focusing in the not-for-profit space, but basically kind of being a death doula for nonprofits and in an organizational context. And I think we, we have this more and more and more and longevity is kind of baked into the business plan but i guess maybe the when do we just say let's be gentle but like enough sorry online emily are you gonna speak so i've got my hand up it's easier to i'm gonna be eager in the chat last time we had for you we wouldn't want to do that then i'll get to carry on a second matt has also had some she might be able to see on the chat on the screen and jessica as well this is a bit of a sidestep. I was just going to add something to your genie in the bottle thing. I think there's another part to that, especially when it comes to food, but actually when it comes to loads of things and some work, thinking some work, some work I did on hygiene, how do you put cheapness and convenience back in the bottle without putting affordability 
so that not everything becomes for the few, not for the many. So I just wanted to add that. So I'm just waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, actually, that's in my own is interesting because I'm also a deaf doula alongside everything else that I do. So I really want to find out more about that. Um, I was drawing interconnection. I love the how do we make greed uncool. Mm -hmm. And for me, my former corporate life, I was one of the heads of marketing for Formula One, trying to make Formula One cool after in their first ever marketing team. Um, and for me, it was flipping that and drawing that interconnection into Roland and the, the thriving cities of how do we make thriving cool and actually how do we put that pop culture lens on it because actually everything that I've ever done in entertainment brands of making that pop culture cool it is really interconnected it doesn't just happen with sort of one blip so it's almost like what is that that's going to make you know all the generations think this is really cool for things to be thriving and then start demanding stuff in so that was where my mind went with that so thank you thank you both that really inspired me. Uh, I just wanted to add that one thing that gives me hope when it comes to the death of old business models is silent quitting. So people that don't want to work for these companies and decide they want to work for, work for purpose-driven companies. And I think there are more and more people who just say, okay, we just don't want to work like this. So if you see that they've just got no motivation to work, it's going to slowly kill the old business model. That's what I think. That's what I hope for, really. Ready or not. We've got a few comments from Matt. Great. I can go to those. Um, Matt says, can't you express those kind of flywheel slash ratchet effects quite crisply if you can measure what you're trying to improve? Any comments on that? He's also added, amen to globally accessible regenerative systems over cosy middle class Malthusianism. <laughs> so if anyone knows what that means or has an explanation i'd love to hear more because i don't actually i don't know what that word is make make the good or accessible is kind of <clears throat> and we're just waiting for um Sagar's question yeah i mean i think it's um Well, two things. So on the, the measurement piece, I think it's a real balance between it being in the data and being in the world. So I, I measurement is really, well, knowing that you're having an impact and what you're doing is meaningful feels more important to me than the obsessing over the measures. Because I think to what you were saying about the paving stone, I think my observation um, in a business context of being in the data means you go, your like focus narrows to the extent that you don't see the bigger picture. And the data is obviously really great for telling you what is happening. And maybe you can understand the how, but it's not, it's not great for telling the why. And I think this balance between qualitative and quantitative insight and stories versus numbers is kind of is kind of interesting but i also think jessica your point around affordability i do think there's a, a big part of this around well not least that this conversation doesn't only exist in um in a privileged context that it's not i guess um in some of my exploration of social innovation there's amazing stuff happening and at the same time it doesn't lift above the level of school bank and um, food banks and free stuff happening in schools and it's kind of um yeah how do we how do we step into a space that I guess roll into what you were saying of like starting where we are and understanding where we are is kind of a really inequitable an equitable place and I was I was doing a a workshop on Tuesday that if you if we're connected on LinkedIn you might have seen it was with um, a charity called Accumulate which describes itself as the art school for the homeless um, and so they were starting they run a 10-week program called Creative Futures um, and it, we came in on day one and we were doing a session which was really around self-belief and resilience and and effectively they if they miss three sessions of the program then participants are, are out so it's really like how can you stick with this in the room there were 18 people and 
none of whom were street homeless. That's also a condition, but none of whom were in stable housing. And the youngest person was barely 18 and the oldest person was in her 60s. And the the conversations, it was extraordinarily humbling to, to have just the awareness of how precarious things are things can be and how quickly you can go from successful job in the music industry to I have no permanent home I've lost my identity I've lost my I've lost my confidence I've lost my connection to family and having to rebuild and so I guess within this I think there's a the care component is is also really really important a um, really interesting question question from saga shah online do you know the people mining the resources for going green are brown and black and so how connected really are we with the black kid mining the cobalt for the ev car i asked this yesterday at rsa room and no answer as to why going regenerative is okay but let's ignore the perpetual slavery and racism ingrained for it across africa to india are people prepared to look at these now intended consequences? It's the, it, it's almost, it reminds me of, there's, there's a quote in the design museum that says, well, a designer's not, but suddenly a designer is not truly a designer unless they understand exactly how the thing is made. And I think if you sort of look, if you're just sitting in a car company going, well, EVs, that's the thing that we will do. But you have all of those intended consequences, intended consequences behind where the raw materials come from, how they're sourced. That's all on you. And the sort of so the the idea of sort of like just doing green without any of the social or the economic or the inequality or the inequity in that feels Well, you you have to acknowledge it. You have to. And it's all, uh, in the in the case of the car, you go so you have to you have to write it on the car in, in kind of uh, so that you know that it's there. And maybe it joins back to so when Roland was saying about design generally, and going, you think you're doing design and sort of like, am I doing design? Like, 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 I'm I'm not a trained designer, but I feel that sort of like everyone is becoming designers. Because it's sort of like, but it is about owning the the connections between all of the things that underpin the things you're doing. So actually, having that broader consideration about all of the inputs and all of the outputs and all of the things in between, environmentally, socially, economically, that's what design has become. It's a super quick structural reflection, which I think a big part of the challenge is. In most organisations, sustainability sits over here and diversity and equity and inclusion sits over here and it sits as an as a people concern in terms of the employment and potential employment and it's seen in extraordinarily narrow terms. And I think the biggest the biggest frustration that I have in with kind of all of our the private sector work that I do is that division when they are so deeply connected and I think that if they weren't viewed and in two separate silos with really different stakeholders who are incentivized in really different ways we might start to address this not not necessarily in any positive way but but the the deep reckoning would be unavoidable because you'd have to view those two things together and I guess structurally and maybe things like um, the B Corp framework are steps toward this of just not allowing you to see those things in isolation, but beginning to join up the dots in organisational terms. That's good, because that ties into something that you just reminded me of something. So the RSA, I think we talked about this at the last thing in the autumn. So when the RSA was trying to come up with this framework for capabilities of the future, I don't know how many people have seen that, 10 C's framework, and it's all about the sort of deeper mindset shifts you need to see within organizations. One of the challenges we had was finding the right stakeholder in the organization that could sign off on being involved in that work <laughs> because it sort of sat between sustainability and HR and all these other things. And it was very, very difficult to find that one point of, um, yeah, 
who's, who owns it? Who's responsible for it? Is it a shared thing? Um, and that also tied in. So I just got a few other things that I noted down. They're not all related to each other. I just thought I'll, I'll burst them, I'll throw them all out there like, like a shotgun style. Um, but I think there is, there's something in, the, in this conversation we talked about design. And Roland, I think it was in your slides, it reminded me. I, I think there's something about a perspective shift towards the connections, not the people. That's actually quite powerful. Like we still live in a world where we see, or well, the connections are the fascinating things, the things that we you know, we don't pay attention to. It's the people and the individuals that we pay attention to. But actually, I still feel like dark matter labs in particular are doing quite a lot of interesting stuff with trying to look at the relationships as being the things in and of themselves. And the people are just kind of like, I don't know, I'm not saying they're not important, but they're not the things you are. So maybe when we're talking about designing, even it's less about designing the things and it's about designing the relationships or or the relationships to the new things. I don't know where that's going, but that's a, that's a thought. <laughs> um, and then I thought with the making greed uncool. Um, I don't know if everyone's heard of purpose disruptors, but they're basically in the advertising industry trying to um, shift an hour. You know, one, one way to look at advertising is just to say it shouldn't exist. It shouldn't reasonably exist. It just makes us want things that we don't need. Um, get rid of it. I think they're doing some interesting stuff that you know can be controversial, but trying to make it more that if they are engineers of desire, how do you shift the desire into things that are meaningful and worthwhile? And so I think they're worth keeping an eye on. Maybe we should see if we can get them to one of these sessions to talk about that a bit more. Yeah. Uh, and then a really practical question, Roland, at the end. <laughs> The net zero thing, and maybe this is really stupid, it's always confused me about the role of government in net zero. So it does does a local council reach net zero when all the local infrastructure reaches zero or when all the businesses within the, the area reach zero? Like, at what point is net zero zero? Because it is quite confusing when you look at the specifics about who reduces the carbon from where and where does it count? You know, if you're a corporate that you're, you know... Got more, yeah, I don't know. That was a very practical question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was quite interesting to know. Um, if it's all right, I won't answer that last question, <laughs> though I think there are specific definitions of how you define net zero, but that right. might be um, a little chat we can have afterwards, if that's all right. But, um, but I liked what you said and a few other people said, if I can just respond to some of those, including online. Um, uh, your, your comment around design... Uh, designing things rather than the relationships between things reminds me of a book I read years ago called The Geography of Thought, I think it's called. Um, and it does a little thought experiment in it, which uh, is uh, take three words, cow, sheep, and grass, and tell me which two of those go together. And apparently in Western cultures, most people put cow and sheep together because they're mammals. But in Eastern cultures, people tend to put cow and grass together because the cow eats the grass. And it reflects um, English is a very noun heavy language. We have lots of nouns and few verbs. But I believe Chinese, I don't speak uh, Chinese, but it has far more verbs. There's much more about relationships rather than nouns and objects. And so um, in my head, that links a little bit to this very Western centric uh, privileged um, Malthusian, possibly, though I'm not sure what that is, I have an uh, attitude to sustainability, which, you know, we're, we're in an unbelievably kind of privileged kind of elite uh, context here at the RSA, which is kind of lovely, but also I think we should recognise it and call it out for what it is. So I'm grateful to, to the question. Um, I think, go yeah, I've got lots of thoughts on this. I think... Um, uh, the climate crisis, as I said in my talk, is I I think we need to think of it as our unifying mission as a species. It transcends uh, everything. You know, if we approach it with our old capitalist competitive mindset, where it's not going to work, it requires a radically different way of thinking, working that utilizes the talents of everybody on this planet. And And having said that, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. I get overwhelmed on a daily basis, and uh, and if the consequence of being overwhelmed is you do nothing and you wait another day, then that's not good either. So I just want to finish with somebody talked about what gives them hope, um, and also the silent quitting comment. And um, there's definitely a lot of that. I think our work, you know, the first question I talked about my social anxiety at drinks parties. The first question we tend to get asked at drinks parties is, "What do you do for a living?" And if you work for an evil corporation that's killing the planet, that's that's a shameful thing 
to admit to and our work defines who we are as people certainly in western cultures i think and so um uh i think a lot of the pressure for change comes from especially in larger organizations from employees and from that uh, attracting and retaining talent to come and kind of work within those organizations so um yeah, the final cut. Sorry, I, again, this is a bit scattergun. I've already spoken quite a lot, so I'd love to hear from other people. But I heard on a podcast the other day someone saying, hope is not an emotion, but a moral obligation. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's read Rebecca Solnit's book, Hope uh, Hope in the Dark. She talks about hope impels us to act. And so I think it's my responsibility as a parent and as a designer, if indeed I am one, to, to sort of hold on to hope and hopefully try and encourage others be hopeful that we can make a change so yeah those are some of my thoughts who wants this well so i'm conscious that it is two so we had until two in everyone's diaries i know that john is around i know that i'm gonna run to a lecture that i don't know whether louis going to or say but um so um so the conversation can continue i don't think this space is booked for the rest of the day and also if you didn't know the rsa is an open space to the public and actually the challenge of like this environment being super exclusive is a really good one and last year during london climate action week we hoped that we would bring more people into the into the space and i'd really love to um to think more over the next few months of how to do that because um, it is open to everyone. Um, but so I think formally we should say thank you for coming and being part of this. And um, as Andy just did with suggesting purpose disruptors, if you have ideas and things that you want to bring into this space, that would be amazing. We plan on doing another one in February and don't rush off if you don't need to. Yeah, super. I think um, we will... Do one a month this year, see what happens. But maybe not always here, maybe in different places, different people, different voices. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. Um, yeah. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>